Doug Christian from Talk Media News, and I'm speaking with Ivor Itzikovich here in the St. Regis Hotel in Washington, D.C. Mr. Itzikovich has a remarkable story to tell about his career. He started out as a thespian, but now he's also an international merchant. Welcome, sir. Good to be talking to you. Yes. So anyway, I'm initially intrigued because of your perception of our president uh, and how you perceive him in South Africa. So I think this is one of the most exciting periods of time for the United States in a long time. Um, I think it's less about your president than it is about the general sentiment in the country. You know, sometimes in order for positive change to happen, there has disruptive stuff has to happen. And uh, there's been a lot of disruption in the United States, which might be unsettling for most people. But in the rest of the world, we, we've had a very positive outcome because America has been so inward focused. The president is, is, is talking about making America great again and doing stuff that is good for America. And this has made the rest of the world, and especially Africa, wake up to the fact that this big security blanket that they may have thought was out there, called the United States, isn't necessarily focused on their problems. And as a result, it's driven a mindset that has made certainly African countries start saying, we've got to start solving our own problems. And this has been good for the continent, and I think is good for the world, because if it's happening in Africa, it must be happening in Asia and in Central Asia and elsewhere in the world as well. One thing about uh, many people, I would say, not in the Midwest or not in the cent in central United States, but in Washington, D.C., or people who are familiar with the State Department, is that our president is seen as somewhat naive or ignorant about foreign policy. I, I perceive that you see this differently. If, you're, if the president's central focus is the United States, and if the president's central focus is what the rest of the world can do to make value for America, then his foreign policy focus is almost irrelevant because it's all transactional. It's all about business. And again, this may not be the way things have been handled traditionally in the United States, and it's certainly not what the rest of the world is used to. But the president has been very clear on his mission and his objectives. He's been very clear. There's nothing ambiguous about what he's saying about America's foreign policy. Our perception is that he's made a, made a statement that says that America is going to look after America first. So to the rest of the world, if you have relevance to America, we're going to have a great relationship. If you have no relevance to America or you're anti our interests, we're not going to have a great relationship. And I think for the first time in many years, there's clarity in this foreign policy that is helping the rest of the world engage better with the United States. Now, I would imagine in the United States today, this is very unsettling for the establishment. But there's no question that it's going to, it's certainly going to make a different engagement with the United States and the rest of the world. One of the things about the establishment is that they perceive diplomacy as actually a cost-effective means of influencing the world. So it's not just that uh, military spending or military presence actually has an impact, but also perhaps aid, but your thinking is perhaps not. The developing world has today far more relevance to the United States than it ever has before, because globally there is one common fight against terrorism, against extremism, against the stuff that threatens democracies all over the world. And the United States' interest, like the interest of Europe and, and the rest of the developed world, is to deal with this scourge, deal with this phenomenon, which is a recent phenomenon, and a problem that has to be dealt with decisively. And in the context of that, the United States has to look to the developing world as an ally in dealing with these threats. And for that reason, diplomacy and security and military engagement all rolls into one package. And you can't separate these things. If you look at the, uh, the, the, the recent um, engagements that America has had with Africa specifically, its primary points of engagement are countries where there are fundamentalist threats that have impact on the United States. And this is not necessarily a bad thing, because again, it's transactional. The United States is paying attention to what's good for the United States. This is not necessarily um, the way things have been done in the past. It's certainly not the way we'd like to see things being done in the future, because 
In Africa, we see the United, a relationship with the United States as being central to the growth and development of the continent. The biggest problem in Africa is poverty. Once you deal with the issue of poverty, you then can deal with the negative influences that fundamentalism create. America has a big role to play in Africa in the alleviation of poverty, not through aid, not through handouts, not through gifts, but through investment, through physical, tangible partnerships and investments with the African continent. And I think that the current threats that, that are faced by the United States are making Africa more relevant in a way that it hasn't been relevant before. And I think slowly but surely we will get a mindset going in the United States that if you want to counter China's engagement in Africa, if you want to counter fundamentalism in Africa, you have to deal with the economic issues, with the poverty issues. And that is going to come from investment. Of course, your background is about investment, developing industry in Africa. Tell me about that, sir. You can't be in business in Africa if you're not, you don't have a social mindset. You know, the United States is, is, is not altruistic at all. Profit, profit, profit. If we do some social good in the process, this is great. When you grow up, and I, as, as I did, in the struggle in South Africa, when you witnessed the end of apartheid, when you were emotionally connected to the social challenges that the entire continent have, you can't have that approach. So we've built a group of businesses that were primarily focused on making a difference on the African continent. Of course we have to make money, because if you don't make money, you can't reinvest. And I think it's a different mindset, it's a different approach. We have challenges on the continent today that are as big as they ever were before, but they're slightly different challenges. And I think that what we're seeing is entrepreneurs, business people, creative people are starting to take their future into their own hands. We're no longer waiting for the West to come save us. And there's been a lot of talk about African solutions to African problems. It was, a, it was an, a, an academic concept for many years. And now Africans truly are taking their futures into their own hands. And I believe we've been doing that, all. Of, certainly I've been doing it all of my, my career. You mentioned China. Two things. Is China helping to uh, develop Africa for Africa's sake? Or is it using Africa as a means to extract minerals? And is China an adversary with the United States? Or is it a uh, partner? There are many people who think that Donald Trump's Make America Great Again and Put America First concept was his creation. It wasn't. The Chinese have been doing that for centuries. The Chinese see Africa as a critical source of raw materials to drive Chinese industry. For many, many years, the West ignored Africa. For many, many years, the United States withdrew from Africa. And this created a massive vacuum. And the Chinese very ably filled that vacuum. And if you look at the pre-Chinese scramble for Africa and the post-Chinese scramble for Africa, you will see that the Chinese have done a huge amount of good in Africa. There's infrastructure that wasn't there before. Governments have had mechanisms to, to fund their deficits that weren't there before. Mines have been created that were not there before. Capital has moved into Africa. So to turn around and say that everything the Chinese have done in Africa is bad is disingenuous. It's not true. But what has now happened is that the Chinese interest in Africa has sparked interest from the West. So, so what has happened is that the Chinese interest in Africa has sparked interest from the West. And there is a new generation of engagement which can only enhance what the Chinese have done. And I have a philosophy, I, I believe, that this whole concept of everything Chinese is bad and everything from the West is good doesn't apply on the African continent. I think that Africa may well be the one place where the Chinese and the United States and Europe can learn to coexist. And that'll be good for global relations, it'll be good for the global economy, and it'll be remarkable for the continent of Africa. Uh, Donald Trump, contradiction that conservatives see with President Trump is his advocacy for tariffs. I mean, I, 
principal philosophy of, of conservative thinking is we may not know anything but we know money we know money and we are going to and we believe in free trade we believe in open borders that seems the opposite of uh, of president trump how does the world perceive that i think this is this is the one area where there is a massive um, divergence in mindset the rest of the world is going towards open economies tariff free trade and the United States is going the opposite direction. And I think that this is, I think there will be a correction because it'll only take a matter of time for America to realize, or certainly for President Trump to realize, that this is reciprocal. What's good for America has to be good for the rest of the world, and what's good for the rest of the world has to be good for America. And I think that tariffs, the concept of tariffs hasn't, ha have absolutely not worked. A couple of days ago, a free trade agreement was, dis was signed in Africa, which will be revolutionary for the African continent. 54 countries got together in Kigali and signed an agreement to eliminate inter-African trade tariffs. Now, this will completely revolutionize the continent. Now, if America embraces that concept, then AGOA expands to the whole continent of Africa. Africa gets goods in from the United States at lower tariffs. This will counter the Chinese. The, 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 um, this will grow industry in Africa. It'll be good for the world. But for, for as long as America closes its markets to Africa, it will find that its access to African markets is also restricted. So logic will eventually prevail. It's just a matter of time. But you know what? If President Trump would not have imposed tariffs or, or, or started talking about the imposition of tariffs, then maybe... African countries would not have got together and said, hey, hold on a second, we can't rely on AGOA. We need to come and make our own economy and create our own free trade zone. So a lot of these policies in the United States may actually be, be having a positive impact on the developing world as the developing world realizes that it has to find its own solutions to its own problems. The future of Africa depends on governments' abilities to create industry which will create jobs, and through the creation of jobs, we will alleviate poverty.